So, so just a word on Mike Leonard before we, before we play his video. Um, Mike was uh, someone that I met with l last year when we were first trying to develop how we would begin to integrate programmatically what we do in innovation and what happens in the East Falls campus. And I have to say, in, in, in addition to being gifted and decent, he is one of the most egalitarian educators that I've had the opportunity to work with. So I, it's, it, dealing with Mike and working with Mike and figuring out cool stuff to do with Mike has just been great. And so we, we are so delighted. He is the dean of the, and I love his signature, don't you, designedly yours? He puts that on everything. So that's how he titles his lecture, designedly yours. He is the dean of the School of Design and Engineering at the Jefferson East Falls campus. And just, uh, just he, let him tell you in his own words uh, what, what he thinks about what he's up to. We are actually sitting on carpeting that was designed by one of our students and suspended ceilings from Armstrong, that's all our students. So it's like very hard to get away from us, you know, we're everywhere. The common ground that we stand on, the folks in the medical professions as well as the folks in the design professions, the technical professions, the business world, is that our job is improving the human condition. You want the products and the spaces and the objects around you to help you somehow, to make you feel better, to make your job easier, to make you safer, more comfortable. Well, that's very much the same job as all of the doctors and the healthcare professionals at Jefferson Center City. One of the things that's very nice about having the opportunity to come speak to the larger Jefferson audience is that it gives me a really great opportunity to present what design can do. I think it's very important that everyone walks away from my talk knowing that Jefferson has a world-class design organization ready to work with them. The title of the talk is actually interesting, Designedly Yours, what's that all about? I started signing the letters that I wrote, Designedly Yours, and it was to give the letter some kind of distinction. You knew you were holding a piece of paper that came to you from a designer, and so over the years that has occurred on all my mail, and it was picked up and someone said that would make a really good title for a talk. And actually it is, because the talk that I'm about to give is about all of the wonderful design that is now part of the Jefferson family of, of education. And so that way, everything is designedly yours. Everyone, please welcome Mike to, this, to the microphone. Thank you. All right, so I have to uh, start with uh, a disclaimer there is absolutely no way that I will ever be able to explain all of the wonderful things and the great programs that happen on the East Falls campus. It's just impossible. So some of my colleagues back at East Falls are potentially going to be a little annoyed because they didn't get a shout out or a mention. So that's the disclaimer. The other thing is that uh, I've taught for 37 years. It's hard to believe. I've taught for 37 years, and I will tell you that during the lecture, if something's uninteresting and you get a little bit bored, you have my permission to do what my students do and just pretend you're interested, not a lot, and things like that. I'll be good with that. Um, Today's presentation is uh, mostly about the East Falls campus. Uh, it's mostly about the dimensions to the design disciplines that you may not know. Uh, and so that was really my purpose. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to take the first part and be able to explain just a little bit about uh, the programs. Uh, again, it's just going to be a broad brush overview. And then the second part, there are some issues about your understanding of design that I would like to make sure we put on the table. So that's the way this presentation uh, will run. Uh, there are so many uh, disciplines represented in East Falls. So in our campus, we have the Canberra College of Design, Engineering, and Commerce. Uh, that has 25, 26 programs uh, in it. Uh, we have the College of Architecture and the Built Environment. Uh, that, I think at last count, has 12. It may actually have one more since we did the slideshow. And then uh, the College of Science, Health, and the Liberal Arts, which is going to be going through some changes, but currently 
that has 25 uh, different programs. Uh, one of the things that uh, you would think about, I often do walking through campus, is that I'm part of the world's largest idea development companies. I have so many disciplines that I can reach out to, so many professionals that I can reach out to uh, to solve a problem, to take a look at a new situation, to propose a new design and development. Very few people have that, and so I feel quite often, you know, uh, kind of cocky. It's actually, oh, we can handle anything. It's a snap. So you'll see some of that as we go through to today's presentation. We have uh, part of our uh, signature Nexus learning is an approach to learning that uh, is uh, active. Uh, we have most of our uh, work that we do with our students is project based. It's collaborative. Uh, most of the work we do is team focused, meaning that you know your place as a professional on a team and you know how to extend your knowledge of the profession based on the context you find yourself in with, with other uh, disciplines. And then real world, which everybody wants to say they're part of the real world. We mean it. Uh, we are industry sponsored largely. Uh, the idea is that we, and you'll see some examples of that, we believe in embedding uh, industry into our programs, into the classroom in rather innovative ways. As a matter of fact, half the things that we try to do every darn day, a lot of people took a look at and said you couldn't do that. You're, you could only do it on the graduate level. And we'll talk a little bit about that as I go along. But the industry sponsored part of it brings the real world to it. But it's more than that, too. Nexus Learning is also infused with the liberal arts. You know, we believe as you go forward, uh, looking at all of this, that we need smart people. We need them to be smart, well-researched, well-resourced, articulate, uh, ready to act and, and speak as and communicate with each other as true professionals would. The liberal arts helps us do that, and it goes all through all four years of the program. It's not like, let's hurry up and just get it all done out of the way, liberal arts, and get on with the real stuff we came here for, that design stuff, that engineering stuff. No, this is, let's build. As you grow as an individual, let's keep adding to your understanding. And so that's what Nexus Learning means to us. And we've been doing it for a while now, and we're really good at it. So um, this is the college that I am part of. This is the Cambar College of Design, Engineering, and Commerce. Uh, again, it's a, a really unique uh, home, uh, not just the building, but the idea of bringing disciplines together in that way in a single college. And again, we have uh, the design disciplines. I'm going to talk a lot about them today. Um, we're concerned with desirable. Do you want these things that we've designed? Do we, do we answer a need you have? Do we answer a want you have? Um, we have engineering, which is mostly concerned with the feasibility of certain things. Boy, all these words sound like I'm, I'm pulling them down and making it real simple. There's no one word that could define any one of these, but, um, you know, desirable, feasible. And then you add the business disciplines to it, and you have the valuable. You have a way of expressing how people need to make these products part of our economy, make these products part of their life. And working together, which is the way you would do it in industry, is the way you develop new product ideas, you develop new opportunities, you, you put your research to work in a very active way. And so that's the way that the Cambar College is structured. Uh, I'm going to start with our colleagues. Uh, uh, so again, this goes into I can't possibly mention everybody. I'm going to mention our colleagues in the College of Architecture and the Built Environment. Again, it's a world-class collection of programs. It permeates everything on our East Falls campus. Um, again, we have design in the title, so the School of Design and Engineering is kind of easy to understand. Architecture uh, may not uh, be the, way, the place you would look for for design, except for things like interior design. And yet, the gold bars on the presentation here identify those places that I personally have worked with in the College of Architecture in the built environment to do design projects, to do industry-sponsored design-based projects. And so uh, it is everywhere. Uh, it's in ways that, and dimensions that you wouldn't imagine. But since I'm representing the design side today, there's their slide, College of Architecture and the Built Environment. I hope our colleagues at CAVE someday will get an invite to come down here and speak as part of the Innovations uh, Series, too, because they are doing some fantastic and creative work. Um, this next slide, these are the programs of the School of Design and Engineering. Uh, there are quite a few of them. 
And it's hard to imagine the limits of what we could do with this collection of programs. So we have programs pretty much all different stripes, and I'll show you some examples of some of them. Um, again, we have graphic design and industrial design, and many people know what they are. I'll give you some dimension to those today. We also have programs that you may not be as familiar with, web design, animation, you've seen that so sort of, but you haven't seen surface imaging, which is one of our newer programs, which we can print on anything, which sounds really great, but we're not just a print shop. The, we're not actually a print shop at all. We are uh, uh, studying how does one apply surfaces uh, to spaces, but also how do you apply the images to those surfaces? So how do you give the world a newer complexion in so many different ways? And these people go through intense study of materials and science. They know an awful lot about processes. That's just one program at the master's level, but you'll find those kinds of distinctions in almost every one of our programs. We work collaboratively. I always joke that we always have our Velcro out. We're ready for somebody else to link up with us and do something uh, new, something better, something different. We also work together because it models the way it happens in the profession. Every single discipline is usually contextualized by those disciplines around them, and every project is based on your knowledge of a network of individuals. Yes, you need to be a practitioner in that discipline, but you are better in that discipline if you understand where your discipline is in regards to all others, and you've got a network. So that's one of the reasons why you see this collection of programs. I'm gonna have to get a bigger slide because we keep coming up with new things. One of the things that I should tell you is in our school, we've developed a, a pathways program where the thought now is, which runs a little bit counter to what you do in higher education, you may come in as a graphic designer, for example, and we could encourage you to stay for your master's in surface imaging. So you're a graphic designer with all that capability, and then you have the ability to apply your design to practically anything you could think of, surface imaging. And so we have many of those programs, industrial designers going on to be user experience designers, et cetera. And so the notion is that we've realize that there's no one size of education that fits everyone. So we keep expanding how our engagement with the students can enrich them and perhaps prepare them better and better for the professions that actually haven't been developed yet. Uh, I joke to some of the incoming parents quite frequently when they're bringing their undergrads to school that we all know this, today's careers, tomorrow's careers have, are being invented right now, reinvented right now, but then there's also the careers of the future. And I think we'll find an awful lot of people that are graphic design surface imager, uh, engineer someday down the line, all these hyphens in their titles. And so I like the fact that my job is quite often handing out the hyphens, making those connections that help people uh, do those things. We cover the creative map, and that's one of the things that we would definitely like everyone to know about the design disciplines on the East Falls campus. Now, you're going to have to bear with me a little bit because I'm a teacher and we a class is in session even at lunchtime. Um, there's some ideas I think I need to clarify. I've watched most of the presentations that are part of this series, and I don't disagree with anything. There's been some fantastic people and some wonderful people here. But there's some things that I think, since I'm the person here and this is a microphone, I have the privilege of saying that uh, there's another way to look at this. Let's talk about how Jefferson might view these two words. You see the design part of it, right? And everybody feels that they can talk about design. Design permeates everything, and we've used that word quite a lot, uh, design, design, design. And it's in many of the, the literature uh, about new product development now. It's all design focused, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. But I think it's important that if we're going to cross the lines, as our new advertising program says, that you have to have some information from the people that learn to draw the lines in the first place. And so let's talk about what design, is, how we teach design. The design students are taught that results are expected. So the design part of it, while important, can't be just the object. It can't just be what you're thinking about constantly. It's the process. That's actually the thing you get paid for as a designer. How do you implement the process? How do you evolve the process to solve a problem or to create a new opportunity or to develop a new product? And so you have to place yourself in that process. The, the measure of our success in teaching the process is how confidently our students 
view themselves as young professionals that can then go and immediately apply their skill set, their knowledge, their capabilities, how they can extend themselves into the business world, into the professional world, uh, using the process, understanding the process. I take it as a real uh, success uh, uh, for the way we do this. Every time a student is met with a new product or a new problem from a new corporate sponsor, it might be a device or a material they've never heard of before, instead of sitting back and saying, I don't know anything about that, they say, here we go. And that's the kind of thinking that we hope most of our students have. Now back to what you probably think design is. Um, I, apologize, I apologize, as I said, to all the programs. I'm only going to highlight a few of them. Uh, and so we're so interconnected, though, that to highlight one usually brings in some of the others. And you'll see that as I go along. This is fashion design. Uh, typically, you see the energy, the beauty, the cultural impact. And it's all there. Our fashion designers are terrific. The fashion design faculty are so dedicated to making sure their students are doing the latest and greatest and so dedicated to getting it right. So, so there's a lot there to be appreciated. What you don't see is their understanding, not only of the creative processes, a collection of skills that are just amazing and they take time to develop and they take time to explore. A collection of, of understandings of materials and what materials can be asked to do and how you can challenge what materials can do. You tend not to see that. All you do is say, wow, that looks great. Then the other part of it is, how do you bring it all together in a way that industry sees that and says, okay, that's a product we can make. That's something that we can put in the stores. That's something that can be sold. You need to know all of that in order to do these beautiful things. So if you have this picture in your head of just people sitting in sewing machines sewing, erase that, please. These are design professionals that are actually doing explorations, doing very determined research into what fits comfortably, what moves well, what makes you feel better. Don't I look pretty good? I had to step up my game when I became the dean of the school of fashion. So, uh, This is an, uh, another example of some of the ways we get them involved in that process. And there's only one small example, but this happens to be a fun one. Design X asks the students to work with materials that aren't traditionally viewed as fashion materials. It's not fabric. Uh, it's not any kind of garment-based material. You have students working with things that's plastic sheeting, uh, uh, items from the dollar store, uh, trash bags. Uh, you know, I hate to say trash bags because it makes it seem like it's not creative. But it's not arts and crafts. This is actually a determined case to take a look at solving a design problem but removing probably the easiest thing to do, which is to start draping fabric, to start using fabric. These objects still have to move like they would normally move. They have to make an impression like they would normally make. Everything in not be made out of material. The items that you're looking at on the screen right now, if I remember correctly, are made from a shower curtain. There's plastic knives and forks in there. Uh, there's something else. The glitter that you see comes from something you might not expect. They smashed a Christmas bulb and put it on the garment. Everything about it, though, is right when you see it on the runway because they solved the problem through the process. And that's really the point that I would like to make. Also, something you may not think of as fashion, but is actually because of the process. Fashion design and engineering students worked together with NASA's main supplier to come up with a, a set of proposals for the space suits, the space gear of the future. Right? What does space wear look like when we start making more commercial flights? When, when, you know, it's not a military person that we can say, you'll wear that because we told you so. This is now someone that paid a bazillion dollars to go to Mars and needs something to wear to make it there uh, and have all the safety and the comfort and things like that. You can't order them to wear a certain garment. You have to allow for the fact that humans wear garments differently. And so that's one of the things that this explored. Um, again, it's just one small example, but it's an unusual and unique combination. Uh, someone once said, oh, well, it's great they had engineers in there to figure it out. And I'm like, oh, the conversations were intense. The deliberations over details were amazing. The exploration into materials were fantastic and incredibly deep. And then the engineers showed up. <laughs> the fashion designers are using their craft and their skill, and they're giving inroads to then collaborate further to make a deeper understanding of materials and a deeper understanding of what fit is and safety is and comfort is. And working together, you get rather unique results. I should point out that in a national uh, voting competition, uh, 
I think we took all of the top spots. This one actually took the top spot. So. Um, you also don't associate things like biohazard suits with uh, fashion design, and yet here we are. Uh, I'm showing these to illustrate that it's the educational process that opens the students up to a variety of different things. And so, again, the disciplinary strengths, in this case you had textile engineers, textile designers working with the engineers and with the uh, fashion designers to take a look at one of the problems with these biohazard suits is doffing and donning, putting them on and taking them off the correct way. Well. You could give that to somebody who knows an awful lot about the biohazard, you wouldn't get so far. You could give that to someone that knows an awful lot about the material, you wouldn't get so far. Do all of that and give it to somebody that knows how to control fit and access and comfort and, and movement, like fashion designer, and suddenly you get this wonderful product that you wouldn't have gotten from any one of those disciplines. And so again, this is, they entered it in an international competition and they won, which is really great. We're very proud of that. Now back to the fashion design you think you might expect to see. So um, our year-end fashion show is something to be seen. If you haven't been there, you should go. This year it's on the, I'm going to make sure I get it, Thursday, April 26th at 7 p.m. at Sherman Mills. Uh, it's a runway show that is to, or I always believe, slightly above the standards of the industry, a professional fashion show. It's not a school fashion show at all. Um, what happens is now, uh, as we've been exploring our collaborative selves more and more, we find that increasingly of the many, many collections that go out on this runway, many of the collections feature textiles that were designed and developed in collaboration with the fashion designers and produced uh, at East Falls. And so nobody does that. You're designing the material, designing the look of the material, you're designing the garment that goes with that look, and then you're producing the garment all from that. Uh, as part of a collaborative exercise. And so that not only models industry, but actually jumps it a little bit ahead because a lot of times the designer does not get to speak to the textiles that the garment is made of. And so in the past seven years, more and more of the collection are featuring our textiles walking down the runway. Um, we have international programming. Uh, uh, our students are working in abroad. We have a, a new arrangement with our Masters of Fashion Design Management uh, with Milan Polytechnico as well as some others. Um, we have a New York immersion experience where our students uh, learn here and learn in New York th during the same semesters. Uh, and then we show regularly at New York Fashion Week. Uh, we actually show professionally at New York Fashion Week. They're not making allowances for students at all. So it all comes down to education, which is another set of terms that I'd like to clear up a little bit. It's our central part, it's the central part of our mission. It's what we do. And yet, quite often that too is misunderstood. You don't get an education in design. It's not something I can give you. So again, uh, likewise, when we're talking about uh, design, the educational outcomes are expected. We're going to evolve you in learning, involve you in learning more and more about your skill set, learning more about your understanding, but we're going to add to that the process that it makes you not only a lifelong learner, but actually makes you hungry to keep adding new components to what you can do, what you can explore, problems that you can take on, issues that you can do. And then we as educators have to keep learning as well. We have to keep challenging ourselves to come up with newer and different ways of helping our students explore that. And so, again, it's the teaching part of it. It's that active learning that we're focusing on as much as the outcomes. We still have fabulous, wonderful, terrific outcomes, but the best outcome is when I've built your understanding, when I've actually made you hungry to learn more. This is uh, an example from graphic design. Uh, graphic design is, is one of those where, uh, you know, it's graphic design communication is the name of the program. It is an internationally award-winning program. Uh, agencies worldwide have our students. I started putting together a list and then I just stopped. I mean, they're everywhere. You, are, you have quite probably read something this week that was part of a publication that was put together by one of our graphic designers. Uh, no doubt, but our students are designing not only things like advertising campaigns, campaigns for different programs, publications, they're doing corporate identity programs, uh, communications of all types, wayfinding and signage, uh, exhibition design, uh, packaging, you name it. I mean, there's just, if it has the graphic image and it's trying to communicate to someone, chances are our students have worked on it, our alums have worked on it. I put this out to show an interesting example of, of an industry-sponsored project. 
you don't realize it, but when you're holding a board game or you're looking at uh, packaging, you're actually looking at graphic design applied to another whole set of processes for packaging. In this case, this corporate sponsor came in and asked the students to take a look at a new program they had for introducing younger and younger audiences to chess. So not only did the design of the chess game and all of the parts involve doing a really good job at that, but they also, the students had to explore educationally, how do you introduce something this way? How do you define what the game of chess is and why a youngster should be involved in it? And so that's one of the things that you see here is, is an example of, of one of the projects. Uh, the, these were intended to go into production. I mean, that's, that's one of the things the sponsor gave the project and said, you no, know, we're looking for something to take forward, and they did. Uh, working with uh, educational partners, sponsors as educational partners, is something that takes a little bit of skill because they understand the demands of the indu industry world and they understand those schedules. We, of course, have to live on the academic schedule, and so I credit our teachers uh, with having a, a lot of uh, deft and uh, being very politically savvy to navigate the process of how do you keep introducing these things into the uh, academic calendar to get them to work. The gold standard for us are when these industry pro st sponsored projects can be put into a normal classroom with a normal schedule and worked on collaboratively with other classes. And so uh, most of the examples of our work you see will have that feature to them. Our faculty are absolutely terrific and part of their uh, professional development quite often adds new dimensions. This is uh, Frank Baseman, who's the director of the Graphic Design Communications Program. Um, our, factor, our faculty in design are all professionals and so we tend to, instead of giving you some boring lecture that you probably wouldn't want to hear anyway, we're likely to come in and tell you what our day was like, what our week was like, what the latest work with a client was like, or what we did during, say, our sabbatical study or, or on a research project that we're working on. In this case, Frank Baseman's interest in letterpress, a rather old form of producing graphics, uh, gave a fresh take to a lot of our students. But also, he's now used his interest in that to build uh, programming, to build workshops, to build talks, where he can introduce other people to the, this technique, this uh, way of looking at graphic design. And so he's used an old technique to kind of expand our students' set of capabilities. And so, again, we, we like sending our faculty out on these uh, uh, projects. So now we're at industrial design, which happens to be my home base. Uh, and so forget everybody else. I'll talk about industrial design. Uh, <laughs> Uh, our students work on products of all types. I actually, again, started a list of everything they do, and if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read that entire list. It's about 40 pages. No. Um, we have uh, consumer products, electronics, scientific and technical products, furniture, lighting, toys, soft goods, medical equipment, tools, retail spaces, and I'm going to stop there, but it goes on for quite a while. Our alums have worked on products you own, products that you deal with every day if you put your iPod in an iOM uh, clock radio or speaker system. Practically, I think all of those were designed by our alums. We have three of them there. Armstrong World Industries, we, in the bit of tape you saw the ceilings and the floors, ceilings, floors, walls, and other things. So basically, we could surround you in almost any environment with work of our alums. Uh, Target, uh, Fleetwood, who makes most store displays, Stylex Seating, uh, Timberland, Cole Haan, Nike, I mean, the names, I like when people just stand up here and do names, like that's an important, but we do work for all of those folks and we're very blessed because they, as professionals, our alumni, come back to us and give us projects, but also come back to us and enrich our students. Uh, we have things like the Colab design competition. These are sophomores. They were asked to uh, design a stool as part of a museum competition, uh, honoring or, or with the inspiration of an architect. Uh, and not only did they do a really great job and evolved something very unusual in the stool, but they took the top places in the competition. Um, industry and craft, that's one of the reasons I put this down. We do have the ability to craft things, and we do have a really good sense of that. And matter of fact, in the design of these stools, you see our textile heritage at work. It's really hard to get away from that at East Falls. Uh, so you'll see an awful lot of that in, in a lot of our work. You'll also see things that you might not expect. This is lighting our beautiful Laurel Hill Cemetery. We now have um, 
uh, concentrations in a variety of different things. So our students can explore soft goods, they can explore lighting, they can explore medical products, they can explore a host of other uh, products that are separate product classes, but they take the design process they learned from us and they move it forward into these concentrations. And again, our students have no fear. I mean, this was an incredibly large project in a very spooky place, and they're just like, sure, we'll do it. And with the help of a very talented faculty member, it came to be. So now here comes another word for you to rethink. This one's used a lot, and, and it's used in, in everywhere. It's time to rethink innovation a little bit, or at least I'd ask you for today to rethink innovation a little bit. I watch with appreciation how all the speakers did that, and now I would like to give you a designer spin on innovation. You know, it's really easy to take the new and improved label and smack it on things and say, okay, that's it. You know, it's now, it's new, and it's improved. But what I want you to think about, it's the act of innovating where the newiness, if you will, started that's actually where you need to concentrate. It's where the magic happens. And so, you know, we tell our design students that you have to earn the new and improved label. Someone has to see it and say, oh, I've never seen that before. Oh, that, that's totally unfamiliar to me. It's not something that you can claim for yourself. And so our students are now setting out on the path of trying to deliberately look at the world and say, can we disrupt it in such a way to get things that are actually new? In the definition, the part of it is make changes in anything established. That's a really important a mantra for us, that's what innovation means. And innovation is when you have changed something that is already established, or changed a condition which establishes the thing that you haven't seen before. And so it's really an interesting way of looking at it. We have to do that because we need to teach this process. We can't simply congratulate the innovative result. We've been pretty fortunate because a lot of our innovative results go places. Uh, um, Target asked for a back to school for college students for their dorm rooms project. They asked for a collection of objects. Our students were put to work on that uh, two years in a row. Uh, Umbra, the home goods products company uh, known for its design, came and gave us the project working with Target. And they said, well, if we like the designs, we may offer them in the store. Well, not only did they, but four of them went into the store one year. Two of them went into the store the next year. They sold out in about the first or second week. Uh, the uh, unique arrangement was that our students had in on the royalties. And so did the ID program, which was really great. And so the students actually, can you imagine the heads on these students? They were juniors teaching them when they were seniors, when they had royalty checks coming in already for a project? It, amazing. So, but again, it was an opportunity for us to spread our wings and say, it's their management of the process, these students, these juniors, that helped them feel confident enough to tackle a problem that was then going to go into the store. Also on the confidence level, one of the oldest uh, continuously running uh, collaborations on our campus is the Occupational Therapy Industrial Design Collaboration, OTID. We have to say it that way because of its ID, OT, people keep thinking idiot, so we, we do it the other way. Um, it's an example of how do you build empathy. One of the linchpins of, of design thinking is that you learn to empathize through your observations of others. And so how do you teach a group of healthy 20-somethings about ergonomics, about human performance? Well, one of the ways that I believe you do it is you move to the extremes of human performance. Now, we were lucky because we have a world-class occupational therapy program working in our school, and they had their Velcro out. And 20 years ago, we sat down and figured out, could you do this? Actual clients with actual needs turned over to pairs of occupational therapy and industrial design students to solve a problem for a real client and then build a device and test it. And so that's what you see when you look at a lot of our products. We've now done, I think this year we'll top 450 devices that we've designed over the years in this whole project. We build prototypes and we have them tested. Uh, no topic is off limits. The, here you see the one where the uh, assistant dog in this uh, uh, project became the focus of our attention. And so the, it was the, actually the dog and the service dog's uh, ability to carry things and move about that became the client, if you will, but it's the client's client. So it was an interesting way to look at the project. And so again, I would invite you in April, uh, I want to say it's around April 15th, will be the presentation. It'll be publicized. You should definitely come out to these falls. There will be 30 different assistive and adaptive devices shown uh, this year. So one more word for you all. 
<laughs> this one has got a lot of talk lately, a lot of press, and um, we have an issue with this word, or I have an issue with this word, and since I'm in charge, we have an issue with this word. Um, the, the thought is that design thinking is a thing, and it is, it is it's a thing, but, but what do you do with that? We have people regularly speak as though they are gonna sprinkle some design thinking sauce on something and it's gonna somehow get better. Or if I just say the word design thinking every other five minutes, it's going to mean something. It is about solving problems, but not every design is actually a problem, right? That's not part of it. Sometimes you have to find the problem, but also sometimes it's just answering a need, right? So here's the thing I would like you to think about, and if you walk away with nothing else during my talk today, walk away with this. We design thinking. It's a verb. Designers change the way you think about things. That's their job, right? Think about the evolution of any product that you own, that you love, that you use every day. The cell phone in your pocket, it might be an iPhone, but before that it was a StarTech, and before that it was your mobile phone, and then before that it was your car phone, and then before that it was bolted to the wall and you didn't go much anywhere with it. The notion is you think differently about that now because that product has been designed, it's been allowed to evolve, it's been put forward. That's what we mean. How do you change the way someone thinks about something through your actions as a designer? That's what I want you to think about. Uh, we endeavor to think differently ourselves. Our job as instructors, trying to get people to be design thinkers, we have to train our students to think differently. Don't assume. Suspend your judgment. Consider the viewpoints of others. Propose often and frequently, and don't get offended when someone says that won't work because they now have information to give you that they can tell you, well, boy, what, what makes you say that, you know? And it's not an argument we're looking to have. It's more design thinking. And so that's one of the things that we do, and I would love it is as you went forward, every time you think or hear someone design thinking, ask the question, well, how do you think as a designer? Or how do you change the way people think? Because it would open up a bigger disruption, discussion, excuse me. I have some uh, examples of things that you, you might be familiar with. These come from my career. Um, so I'm the designer of the automated checkout that you have in the supermarket. Sorry, folks. Yeah, that's me. D uh, design thinking doesn't always give you positive results. No. Uh, it's a really great product if it works in the utopian setting you know as long as there's nothing else around it as long as there's no kids as long as it's not a two by four in Lowe's you're trying to run by the scanner it works pretty good um, it really the suburbia view of that product is one of the ones that ha has challenged it as it's gotten its acceptance in the marketplace um, but it was designed by somebody and here we go and I uh, my kids hate it when I go to the store with them and one of those things is what's offered to, oh dad don't start but it's true it, it you know I, I could help um, you know nobody none of your fellow shoppers seem to appreciate the explanation as we go forward but <laughs> I often go back to the sketches that were done uh, 20 years ago now and say you know it could have been different and I'm like well it wasn't so get over it Leonard um, so Another product that I would like to do, and this is a really great example of, of how you might think differently about an everyday object. You're familiar with the object on the right, which is the, the Glide dental floss dispenser. And the object on the left, you may see, it's very popular. Johnson & Johnson makes it, which we like Johnson & Johnson. They're a sponsor of a lot of our projects. I'm not wrapping them. But um, there's two different ways of looking at things. So there's features, hard, corners and sharp edges and it's got a shiny surface and it's made from really thin plastic and it works really well. It dispenses, sure enough, it dispenses floss, which is what it's supposed to do. Uh, the one that we came up with uh, did all of the dispensing of floss, but it did it in something that was hand friendly, finger friendly, had soft radiuses, had a surface on it that made you, meant you weren't going to drop it, it wasn't going to slip out of your hands. Uh, and even the way it was manufactured and things like that, uh, factor into why perhaps you may like that product better than the other one. Some of the innovations that are, are in every product are based on the collection of small innovations, the, the things that, that you do uh, to make the product, in, so, excuse me, in some cases, uh, change the way you do it. So, for example, the original product had a 
uh, if anybody knows about molding, the deeper the draw is on the part, the deeper the part, the longer it has to stay in the mold, which means every part costs more as it goes along. But then it also means that you have to stick all of the uh, device that goes inside all the way down inside, and quite often that has to be done by a person, difficult to do it by a machine. So we designed it so that it was flat and it opened up as a molded part, and so that you just touched the things right onto the surface, and we made some of the parts smaller, which is always nice, you're using less material, and it folds up into a really uh, cool looking, we hope you think it's cool looking, cool looking container. The innovations that you do, you try to make it a decidedly different project. Uh, you know, the object is trying to uh, engage you somehow, and so on this, on the existing product, on the Johnson & Johnson version, it opens, it makes a really funny click, um, it opens very easily, so it's probably open in your pocket if you have it right now. Um, it uh, still dispenses floss, but you're holding it the whole time. You've got those edges and you've got the shiny surfaces. Ours kind of has a skin-like feel to it, so it's kind of holding you back, not to be creepy. And um, it's got this mouth that opens, but when the lid opens it, uh, and closes, it covers up the business end where the floss is, so it keeps it nice and clean and, and you have that assurance. You're actually opening its mouth Right? How's that for a little connection to what this thing does? And it smiles at you the whole time you're flossing your teeth, which is on purpose, right? It gives you a little window as to how much floss is in there, so you don't have to shake the container to see if it's filled. The idea is like involve it, like bombard it with all of these things you could do. I'm going to design it anyway. Why not design it from a design thinking space that says I could do anything to this thing? And I'll give you one last uh, uh, thing, which uh, if you look, if you take a look at the, oh, that didn't advance. If you take a look, okay, why is it going backwards? There we go, there we go. Um, if you look and, and think about the fact that I, as the designer, am trying to have a conversation with you, right? So you want dental floss, probably because there's something in your mouth you don't wish to be there. So open the mouth of my product, and in there, it's holding in its own teeth the piece of material that you wish to use on your teeth. A little creepy, but fun, you know? It's almost like a little comic book uh, in your hand when you try to use it. You'll never look at this product the same again after I tell you that, <laughs> right? But you, you will find, if you look at a lot of the products you like in the world around you, there's some designer trying to have a conversation with you deliberately trying to have a conversation with you. That's why you like Apple products. Deliberately picked the radii, deliberately did the graphics a certain way, deliberately did all those things, and got you to addicted to the fact that that's the way it ought to be. So that's the idea. And I'll leave you with one other thing that you can charm people with at parties if you happen to be dental flossing in public. <laughs> the little clip that holds the thing closed is when you take the two teeth on top and jam something in between the two teeth. How's that for tricky? Please have conversations with designers. Please engage yourself as much as you possibly can with products. Give people feedback. If you have the opportunity to visit East Falls, we'd love to have you. Uh, we, we like showing off, so that, that's no problem with us. Uh, we would definitely welcome uh, other people from our tribe coming to talk to you and, and explain what design means to us. So thank you very much for your attention. I think anybody's going to look at a product the same way after that presentation. <laughs> Certainly not dental floss. So um, I'm, t I'm still pondering the word newiness. <laughs> I'm adding that in. That's part of the lexicon. Questions, uh, and let me, just, uh, let me just mention, any of you that are streaming in, please feel free to tweet questions. Do you have the tweet address? Can we put it up? Um, so tweet us a question, and we'll pose the question to Mike and, um, and Raj here. Thank you, that, that was wonderful. Uh, one question I have, and that's connecting different concepts that you brought up, which is the focus on the process and thinking differently uh, and so on. And if, if I stitch it all together, then it seems to me that essentially you're talking about this as a continuous stream where there may be milestones that you mark off, which means the success of your product suddenly now would have to force you to now say, you still have to think differently now because if that's a new standard, how is the next one is going to look like? Yeah. So how do you incorporate that in the way that you, you, you teach uh, in your curriculum concept? So it's funny because I have one of my students here who he, I should put you on the spot and make you answer the question. In class, we talk about this all the time. If, if it's a process and you're working on these 
products and you're constantly answering the problem, you create problems when you answer one problem. We call that job security for a designer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we're not advocates of the yearly model change. However, nothing is steady state. Uh, we do have designers in our midst. They're very respected. I love them a lot. Uh, they design as though the object's going to go into the museum. I don't know the last time somebody legally bought something from a museum or took something from a museum to use. Uh, we look at the, it as though, no, these are everyday objects. As you change, the objects around you should respond and change. And we as design, I never, and the students know this, we don't call it final presentation or final object or final design. It can't be. Uh, not if it has any real value. It's got to be something that you're going to come back later on and do that voodoo you did all over again to make the object much better. Could you design some way using facilities that are available for us downtown people who don't drive around to get out to where you are and, and get firsthand what you're doing? I, I, I think that would be wonderful. Uh, a bus would be obvious, and we, we should be working on that. A Zeppelin might be fun. Uh, some of the things that, that we need to do is actually find ways of circulating people across the campus because I think you're, especially for designers, I think your understanding of design is all based on what you appreciate about the results. And we love the fact you do that. But boy, it would be nice to go stand next to some of these people while they're doing it and see what they did. So I, anything we can do to make that happen, I'd love that. So I, I can actually help answer your question. There are a couple of different pr processes that are being developed right now to be able to facilitate students and faculty and people living in, in the larger Jefferson world being able to go back and forth. I mean. As a technical matter, you can take the Jefferson Station train to the East Falls Station, and it's a little bit of a hike. Um, I actually had suggested that we put golf carts in the uh, parking lot near St. Bridget's Church, because I know that neighborhood, and golf cart people in, for those of, for those of us who are not bikers. Um, but there, I think now there is an indigo bike rack at the train station, so there's, there's a little bit better connectivity, and, but there is in progress a couple of different ways of, of trying to improve that. Yeah. So, anybody else? Questions? Where's your student? This one. Oh, I have it. Oh, here. <laughs> we need a this one. Is he the one who's up there? Yes. Okay. Yes, he is. Uh, so, Evett, is, is, have I lied to anybody, Evett? There we go. How's that? No, no he hasn't. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, this man I admire a lot uh, due to his uh, due to his ability to actually get everyone in this room to think differently about design. Um, he is uh, uh, quite great at getting people to uh, think differently. Uh, he's a molder of minds. Uh, he just like, uh, he's, he's like an injection molding machine. He just like, <laughs> just like shoves information in your brain and you are a completely new person after being in this program. So Boy, it never was worth more my sending him. No, okay, no. no. <laughs> Thank so you, Evett. So many years ago, um, I had a design in my mind, which I put in the piece of paper, to solve a problem that you normally face every day on the street. And I sent it to my engineering student. No, sorry, friend. He was an engineer, I knew him. And he said, you couldn't do it possibly. But I think if it is done, it will be very, very useful. So do I approach or approach your student? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. We, we've, so got, we've, got, we've got our engineers trained to, though they may be thinking, oh, you can't do that, they say, well. And so that's your way in. And, we'll, and working with the design students, we, we usually get things done. We don't accept that you can't do it. You just can't do it now, or you can't do it for economy or something. But of course you can do it, unless it's defying gravity. But we're working on that. So, so Mike, let me just, as a point of personal privilege, ask a question. So suppose somebody in this room has a project that they want to develop. What's, what's the entry point for, for East Falls campus to engage in uh, reimagining a product that they work with or reimagine or creating something entirely new de novo? 
I'm really glad you asked that. There are so many structures we've now had in place uh, to do it. You can go through the innovation pillar and talk to the folks there. Uh, we have our, our vice president of innovation, D.R. Witter. You can go through there. Our, uh, pro, our vice provost of research, Ron Kander, is actually the dean of, of the College of Design, Engineering, and Commerce. Uh, you can go through that uh, window. Uh, I would say to speak with any dean on the East Falls campus is a great idea. Uh, sometimes going right to the faculty, uh, you wind up in the queue with a lot of other things going on, but uh, we put in plan place plans to actually have people available to help navigate ideas to the right spot on the East Coast campus, uh, East Falls campus, because, uh, there we go. East, uh, West Coast we're, campus we're coming soon. Over, watch out. Um, the, the thought is that quite often you don't know who to approach or what uh, department might be the right one and so we've decided to put a few people in place that actually are versed in what we can do and how we do it that can get you to the right person and make sure that your idea is moving ahead uh, some projects are uh, it's a task it's a activity that a student could do one-on-one -on -one. others are class projects and some are research projects of long duration and so rather than assuming one size fits all it's good that we have a number of people that can help uh, guide people to the right spot so if I could just note for the record how flat that hierarchy is, call one of our deans and we'll help you figure out where to go. I mean, that, how, how many places does that happen? Any, anyone else with a question? Sure, my, my question is somewhat uh, philosophical. Um, I'll look what, 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 yes. <laughs> what, what comes first? Is it the, the question or, or the answer that design provides? I mean, it seems that really great design actually answers or solves problems we don't even think of as problems. So I'm wondering, how do you, how do you bridge that gap? Is there a way to, um, to approach design and, and I think so, so we approach it from two different uh, aspects because we want to cover all the bases. Uh, for example, in our materials and processes class, where our students are learned, they do a thing called a product autopsy, which is really great now that we're part of Jefferson because you can say that and scare people, uh, where, where they deliberately take products apart and they find out, of course, what they're made of, how they go together. But you're also, the whole time you're doing it, looking for opportunities or you're finding opportunities that that should be better or could be different or we could make it from a different material. So. That's one way of looking at it. The other one is we spend an awful lot of time with our students doing observational research, learning how to do, how to be good observers. It's not all output. The assumption is we're walking around furiously sketching. We do, but it's after some observation, after interviewing people, after talking to people, after engaging them in what they do. And so between sort of the hard facts on the ground, this is what that object is and how it could be made better because it has a problem, to I think I found a problem. You know, in the occupational therapy project, one of the things that happens quite frequently to the students is that they've got a stated area of need, and they go visit the, the client educator with the occupational therapist, and they see it, and it's like, well, that wasn't that big of a problem. But while I was there, I noticed this, and that turned out to be the real problem, the real thing. And so we tell our students, shut up. No, we, we, tell, our <laughs> students, we tell our students, allow yourself that quiet space where you can observe engage people, ask them about how their day was and watch how they're answering. We've had students design furniture uh, and people are polite and somebody's asked to sit in the prototype chair mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, you're comfortable, right? First of all, designers should never say that. They should always ask, are you comfortable? But since it's a designer's chair, quite often the person will say yes. In the meantime, they look like they're sitting in a, you know, they're a pretzel and they're like, you can't possibly be comfortable. Let's take this apart. So I can't say one size fits all, but some people come to us with things that are absolutely problem, we need to fix this. It has to be disposable, it has to be whatever the problem is. And in other cases, we're presented with a situation. Sometimes the best design, most entrepreneurial design comes from the fact where you yourself are so alert to the environment around you that you find the problem. You've got these magnetic eyes and they just sort of like stick to you. That's one of the ones where those students, uh, we value them a great deal. Uh, this is a follow-up question for Dr. Thakur, who said he has an idea and he comes to you. Yeah. Do you have a process in which he can get royalty or he doesn't get royalty for his idea? Well, you get, if it, there, there are some questions, there, there are structures uh, in place now at Jefferson, but we've always had structures at East Falls as well for how do we handle who owns the idea or how it's transmitted outwards. And so fortunately, we have great pipeline now where we can transfer something into industry. Usually the royalty question doesn't even come up unless you start that process of transferring to royalty. I mentioned Target, that was put on the table in the very beginning. 
that was something they offered because they wanted high levels of buy-in from the students and from the school to doing these products in a very professional way. They didn't know we would have done it that way anyway, but the royalties are great. So, um, but there's no one way to do it, but it's usually at the point that it transfers that we have those intense conversations about what's, how do you value this and what would somebody do to express their value of it? So if I could just add a little bit to that, Rose Ritz, our EVP in innovation, has been meeting with Dr. Spinelli to try and reposition thinking around what's possible. Um, because the East Falls campus has developed historical and significant corporate relationships that we want to be respectful of. Uh, and we, but we also want to figure out where the opportunities are to reposition so that that gets, potentially gets monetized in, in different kinds of ways that are mutually beneficial and, and kind of blow the doors off what, what the possibilities are. Would that be fair, Heather? Did I, okay. Do you want to add anything to that? Heather is our director of licensing and, and all things uh, creative that can be monetized. I, I would say I like the technical term of blow the doors off. That's, that's really good. Really yeah, I like that too, actually. <laughs> yeah, newiness, exactly. Whole new vocabulary today. Well, I, I, I don't want to go on the tangent, but I will say that one of the things that struck me was your definition of innovation. And recently in the office, we had a really interesting conversation where we went around the room of everybody who works in the innovation pillar and said, what do we think innovation is? And everybody had a different opinion and thought, um, which, was, which I thought was very interesting. So my view of innovation for me is siloed by what I do. And it's about the fact that this doesn't matter if it stays here. So what we do doesn't matter if it doesn't get to the people who need it. And so your answer is correct. Your answer is correct. We'll work with you. And it depends. But we're motivated to help get the stuff that we make to the people who need it. That's, that's a philosophical challenge, too. What's your, what's your new definition of innovation? You know, like, how do we do that? Anyway. Well, that's going to be a long conversation. <laughs> a follow-up question? Uh, before the merger, uh, we were of the uh, thought or we were told that if we think of anything related to health sciences in our jobs, it belongs to um, Jefferson. Uh, but if we thought of making a tomato sauce or a new recipe, you can do it. It's all your own thing. Okay. With this merger, does anything we think about, any design we think on and off, uh, belong to Jefferson or not? Is that is the question. If I you have. think I'm going to answer Th that. This is a Heather question. Uh, the answer to this is never super simple, but. No, Jefferson doesn't own your brain. Um, they didn't own it before the merger and they don't own it after. Um, Jefferson owns stuff that results from the pursuit of your scholarship that's, that's reduced to practice using Jefferson resources or stuff that's reduced to practice using Jefferson resources. If you're making your tomato sauce using Jefferson tomatoes that were provided to you using our tax exempt status uh, and you consulted with Jefferson chefs, which don't technically exist, um, there is a place where you could be dancing on the edges uh, pretty squarely in the auspices of Jefferson ownership. If you created that sauce in your home kitchen, then of course not, no. I mean, just the fact that we've put a design school under our umbrella doesn't give us any farther reach than ever before, which was always, the line was always, basically we're a tax exempt um, nonprofit research institution and, uh, and healthcare institution and design school. Um, and uh, if, if we can't use our tax exempt status to basically feed products into for profit businesses, et cetera. So um, once stuff is done here, then it does fall a little bit more into the domain of the auspices of what we would have reached through to under the employment agreement, et cetera. Jefferson tomatoes. Do we have any Jefferson tomatoes? I would love it. Jefferson. You got that. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. right. I, can, I can see it happening now. There's going to be a garden over at the East Falls uh -huh. campus. And we'll that'll be landscape architecture. Yeah. Help we'll, be start, mm -hmm. we'll grow Jefferson tomatoes. And one more question. Any, anybody? Or can we let our, oh, we do have one more. Hi, I have a question for you. Um, do any of your design programs ever um, hire consultants who have an insight into, um, for example, healthcare and the integrity that happens inside a patient's room that's often not documented research, like human behavioral psychology, adherence to evidence-based practice, what ends up happening inside a patient room that's different from hospital policy? Um, do you have programs for students um, that involve health consultants similar to the Jefferson Hackathon where they had medical students and other 
um, healthcare professionals as consultants? Do, you have, do your programs have something like that? So, so the answer is sort of yes and sort of no, and that's because we're in a transition here. Typically, we are blessed because we have adjuncts that have such a broad experience that when they come to teach, they're bringing that experience with them. That's one of the nice things about having professional practice individuals. You know, we're, we're lucky to have people from industry teach with us. And so uh, that hasn't necessarily been one of the, the issues. However, in developing new programs and in coming up with new courses, bringing someone in that has specifically that expertise to work with us to evolve that program, yes. Yes, and, and again, uh, it, it, we, input and, and networking of all different sizes and shapes is something we're very much open to. And you know, again, it pretty much just says, you know, is the time right, is the budget right, is the opportunity there, how do we approach it? So, so I wouldn't say no to that at all. Yeah. So if I, if I could just add a little bit to uh, uh, your query. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for bringing up the hackathon because uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Jefferson ho has hosted now two hackathons. We suspended the hackathon for 2017 because we were working to integrate programs from the East Falls campus with the Center City campus. We will be bringing the hackathon back in 2018. It'll be in November. And um, I'm working with Mike and we're working with lots of other people to figure out how we're gonna make, we're, again, we're gonna blow the doors off it because now we have two campuses and uh, just a whole bunch of new talent and skill and brain power and energy. So, so we're real excited about what the future holds for hackathons with, uh, with, our, new, with our new campus and our new colleagues. So, so thank you for bringing that up just as one of the places where that finds expression. So, uh, so thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we're very appreciative that you took your time to, to be with one of our great new acquisitions, Mike Leonard, <laughs> and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.